outstanding. May I request you to turn, open your Bibles, please, and turn with me to the book of Malachi. The book of Malachi, chapter 1, verses 1 onwards. Malachi, it's the last book of the New Old Testament. burden of the word of the Lord to Israel by Malachi. I have loved you, says the Lord. Yet you say, in what way have you loved us? Was not Esau Jacob's brother? Says the Lord. Yet Jacob I have loved Esau I have hated and laid waste his mountains and his heritage for the jackals of the wilderness. Even though Edom has said we have been impoverished but we will return and build the desolate places thus saith the Lord of hosts. They may build but I will throw down they shall be called the territory of wickedness and the people against whom the Lord will have indignation forever. Your eyes will see and you shall say the Lord is magnified beyond the border of Israel. Verse 6. A son honors his father and a servant his master. If then I am the father, where is my honor? And if I am a master, where is my reverence? Says the Lord of hosts. To you priests who despise my name. Yet you say, in what way you have, have we despised your name? You offer defiled food on my altar. But say, in what way have we defiled you? By saying, the table of the Lord is contemptible. And when you offer the blind as a sacrifice, is it not evil? And when you offer the lame and the sick, is it not evil? Offer it then to your governor. Would he be pleased with you? Would he accept you favorably? Says the Lord of hosts. But now, entreat God's favor that he may be gracious to you. While, he is, while this is being done by your hands, will he accept you favorably, says the Lord of hosts. Who is then among you who would shut the doors so that you would not kindle fire on my altar in vain? I have no pleasure in you, says the Lord of hosts. Nor will I accept an offering from your hands. For from the rising of the sun, even to its growing down, my name shall be great among the Gentiles. In every place, incense shall be offered to my name and a pure offering. For my name shall be great among the nations, says the Lord of hosts. But you profane it in that you say the table of the Lord is defiled and its fruit, its food is contemptible. You also say, oh, what a weariness. And you sneer at it, says the Lord of hosts. And you bring the stole and the lame and the sick. Thus you bring an offering. Should I accept this from your hand, says the Lord? But cursed be the deceiver who has in his flock a male and takes a vow but sacrifices to the Lord what is blemished. For I am a great king, says the Lord of hosts, and my name is to be feared among the nations. Hallelujah. Shall we pray?
Hallelujah. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for the privilege of coming to your throne of grace to worship you, Lord. We thank you for your love, Lord. Not because we deserve to be loved, but in your kindness, in your mercy, you looked at us favorably and picked us up from the dungeon we were in, Lord. We commit your people in your hands, Lord. Speak to us, Lord. Use this wretched, sinful servant, Lord, yours. But wash by your blood, cleanse by your word. This morning I commit myself to speak your word, Lord. Anoint me with your power, Lord, with your strength, with your spirit. Hallelujah. We pray that your name alone would be glorified. Thank you for what you're going to be doing. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Please be seated. This morning, I have titled the message, Honor Your God. I have been burdened with the message for some time now. And I was hoping that God will give this message to our dear pastor. Because I believe that he is more qualified to speak this word. And the other day, he asked me to speak. I submitted myself into the hands of God. Lord, if it is your will, strengthen me, anoint me. Empower me. Because I am so disqualified to speak this word. Malachi, the last of the, of the messengers of the Old Testament. The word Malachi means the messenger of the Lord. There is no other Malachi in the entire scripture. He's the only one. And he lived and prophesied about 400 years before Jesus You know, slavery in Egypt was a torturous, very painful experience for the Israelites. But the exile to Babylon was not as bad. Over the years, people get used to the situations in Babylon. And the kingdoms changed. Babylonian number fell, then the... Median emperor came, then the Persian emperors came. Things were kind of cozy and comfortable for most of the people. So coming back to Judah was not a very tempting thing for them. Nevertheless, about 50,000 of the people returned to Judah. And we read about their coming back in the books of Ezra, Nehemiah, Haggai, and Zechariah. And under the leadership of Zerubbabel, in B.C. 516, we read that the temple was rebuilt and the worship was reestablished. I do not have the time to go into all the details, but you are fairly known basically about all these things. But after the temple was built, not even 100 years have passed before the people completely turned away from God. The priests and the people became equally corrupt. Truths were being distorted and propagated and taught. 
the mere ritualistic religion was being practiced. The laws of the Lord were practiced, were, were, uh, were, uh, were, uh, were rejected. Sins that were never done until then were being committed by the people of God. They were marrying Gentiles and they were practicing social injustice. Just to name, list a few of their sinful practices. And here, through these prophetic verses, Malachi is actually sending a clarion call for repentance, regeneration, and a reformation. You know, we always hear about repentance among Godly, God's people. And a lot of times we even hear about regeneration. But I want to tell you, I want to warn you people, unless your repentance and your regeneration is followed by a reformation of your life, repentance become very surface level. It, if it has to be sustained, it must be followed by reformation. And this will be the last time that generation will be listening to the words of a prophet. And they did not know that. After this, there will be absolute silence and darkness for four centuries. When they were listening to Malachi, they laughed at him. Let me ask you, my dear brothers and sisters, if this is the last time, rather, if you know that this is the last time, you're going to be listening to the word of God. How would you respond to it? How would you respond to it? If you know in your heart that you will not be able to hear the word of God one more time, how would you respond to it? Let me tell you, sadly, the people in Malachi's generation did not know that it was the last time so they ignored him and the message. This afternoon, when you leave this sanctuary, you can ignore also. You may ignore also. You may walk out ignoring this message. Or you could be angry. And very critical about the message and the messenger. Or you could repent, submit, and give yourself into the hands of God to be transformed. The choice is yours. And 400 years later, John the Baptist came carrying the same baton, speaking the same words, repent, regenerate, and be transformed. Hallelujah. He started his ministry by calling his people for the same message that Malachi ended. Malachi opens his prophetic message by a very portrayal of the love of God. And he concludes it with a very graphic image of the judgment of God. Chapter 1, verse 2. God is telling them, I have loved you, says the Lord. But the people responded, you love us? How do you love us? 
And how much do you love us? And God decided to answer them. How much he loved them. In order to do that, in order to answer them, God takes them back to their very origin. You know what he did? He takes them to the beginning of their race. God reminds them, they are the sons of Jacob. That's what he says. In what way have you loved us? Was not Esau Jacob's brother? So actually he bringing two, he's bringing two names together. God reminds that they are the sons of Jacob. They are a people that did not deserve to be chosen. Esau being the firstborn was actually in the family lineage for all the blessings that comes through his father Isaac. It is not because Esau did some silly, stupid things that God rejected him. God rejected him before he was even born. Well before he could do anything bad or good. This was in order to show his mercy on the one he chooses to show mercy. And his compassion on the one he chooses to show compassion. God is telling his people that he loves them. How much to the extent of rejecting Esau and choosing Jacob and making them the children of Jacob and calling them his people and adopting them as his family. God chose Jacob to be the carrier of the message. Carrier of the blessings. Carrier of the inheritance in the messianic lineage. God is telling Jacob's descendants that he loved them to the extent of rejecting the one that the world and the law would have chosen. Let me ask you, my dear brothers and sisters, do you know how much God loves you? Do you at least know God loves you? This morning I have a message for you that this God, the God of universe, loves you. And do you know how much he loves you? Go to John 3.16, our familiar words. God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. How much did God love you to the extent of sacrificing his one and only son for you and me, the wretched sinners? And 1 John 3.16, this is how we know what love is. That Jesus Christ laid down his life for us. Romans 5.8, Apostle Paul is so explicit when he says, but God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were yet sinners, we were not even seeking God. We were yet sinners. Christ died for us. I, re I wanted to dwell here. I wanted to dwell. I do want to dwell, but I don't have the time. That thing is on a race ahead of me. Brothers and sisters, let me remind you. The very fact that you and I are here today 
is the love of God poured upon us. The love that was poured on the most undeserving people like me and you. Let me tell you, in a world filled with hatred and hurt and malice and anger, it's so comforting to know that we have a God who loves us. And God has also placed people strategically around us so we may experience his love through them. We have family that loves us, husbands that love us, wives that love us. We have parents that love us and we have children that love us. We have a pastor that loves us. We have a church and a people of God that loves us. If that is the case, we must show this love that was poured upon us through the way we love others. And that's what God does. Let me tell you, we all go into the dumpster once in a while, don't we? We all go into the dungeon, the dark valleys of experiences that really we don't want to relive one more time. But when we are so down, it is so strengthening to know that there are people around us that love us and want to share their love with us. One of the signature features of this prophetic, prophetic book is that every time God makes a statement, the people ask him, how do you do that? Really? Like mocking God and mocking the man. I wish I had more time, but I want you to, this, this, this book contains only four chapters, Malachi. Please read it every day. There's only 55, 55 verses all together in four chapters. Read it every day. It will speak to you. It will allow the Holy Spirit to transform you. It's a powerful book. It's a powerful book. Let me ask you, brothers and sisters, have you ever thought why God loved you? Why did he love us? This morning, I want to remind you of the love of God that was poured upon us without any reason any merit from us. It's an explicit, explicit demonstration of his sovereignty. Hallelujah. It's based on no merit at all. Not because we were born in a Pentecostal family. Not because we were born in some traditional Christian family. No. He just chose us out of his mercy because he shows mercy upon whom he wants to show mercy. That is the sovereignty of God. And nobody can ask God, why did he choose me and not him? There's no answer to that. Even in eternity, you will not hear an answer to that question. Exodus chapter 33 verse 19 goes like this. I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy. I will have compassion on whom I will have compassion. He calls whom he wants to call and he rejects whom he wants to reject so that no flesh can boast in his presence. Again, Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, 26 through 29, he writes like this. Brothers and sisters, listen to this carefully. Listen to this. If any of you think that you are well qualified to come here, listen to this. Brothers and sisters, think of what you were when you were called. Not many of you were wise by human standards. Not many were influential. Not many were of noble birth. But God chose the foolish things of the world to shame the wise. God chose the weak things of the world 
to shame the strong. God chose the lowly things of the world and the despised things that the things that are not to nullify the things that are so that no one may boast before him. God alone will take glory in your calling and my calling, in your choice and my choice. We can never boast of anything before the blazing sovereignty of God. And this immutable God, this sovereign God, this all-powerful, ever-present, all-knowing God loves you. Ah, what a beautiful experience. Do you love him? If you do, how do you love a God who loves you so much? You can never love God the way he loves you. But he desires and even demands that you love him with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. Deuteronomy 6, 5. There's no room for anything else when it comes to our love towards him. In Luke chapter 14, verse 26, Jesus himself writes like this, goes like this. If anyone comes to me and does not hate, does not hate his father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, yes, even their own life, such a person cannot be my disciple. What am I trying to say? On this Father's Day, am I saying that we should hate our fathers? No. I want to wish all of you fathers, grandfathers a happy Father's Day. But along with that I want to tell you, when it comes to your love towards God, every other love becomes so lusterless that it appears to be hatred. There's no comparison. How should we love him? The one who gave everything for us with our everything, with our all, with our heart, with our soul, with our strength, with our everything that we have. And when you live your life loving your God, it becomes a life honoring your God. You cannot just live a life saying that, I love my God, I love my God, but do everything dishonoring him. They don't go together. When you love your God, you will honor your God. You cannot claim to love God and dishonor him in your life. In fact, Malachi here is urging his people to repent and return and live a life honoring God. And there are so many places. Actually, this book is all about honoring God, Malachi. Honoring God by Honoring your parents, 1 6. Honoring God in your worship, 1 7. Honoring God by your material blessings and offering, 1 14, 2 8 through 10. Honoring God in your marriage and in your family life, 2 11 onwards. Honoring God in your conversations, 3 13 on. I wish I had three hours. Let me rush. I am not even halfway through. Honor God by honoring your parents. Verse 6. A son honors his father and a servant his master. If I am the father, where is the honor due to me? If I am your master, where is the reverence 
due to me. In the Old Testament, God identified himself as the father of the nation of Israel. He was never identifying himself as the father of a person like he is for us. For the nation of Israel he was the father. And in Exodus 4, we also learn when the people received the commandments and the laws through Moses, they made a covenant with God that he will be their God and their master. Thus, Israel as a nation has entered into a covenant relationship with God as God, their father, their master, and their God. Verse 6, a son honors his father, a servant his master. It's, a decla it's, 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 it's an axiom. It's an axiom. A son honors his father. There's no explanation for that. There's no need for explanation for that. The Ten Commandments. The first four commandments are in relationship to God. It's a vertical commandment. Our relationship to God. And the last six are in relationship to family. And this co commandment, honor your father and mother, comes almost in the middle as the fifth commandment, connecting. It's almost like a link, connecting the vertical with the horizontal. You know what that means? You just cannot have a relationship with God. You just cannot have a meaningful or live relationship with God and a meaningful relationship with fellow humans unless you honor your father and mother. Amen. If this doesn't happen, the other one is not happening. You can do whatever you want to do on the stage and in public, but there is no life in it. You honor your parents. It will be a demonstration of the fact that you have a relationship with God and relationship. Today is Father's Day. Let me ask you, my dear young friends and older friends too, Young brothers and older brothers too. And sisters. What is your relationship with your earthly father? How do you relate to him? Some of us, like me, my earthly father is with the Lord. How is your earthly father? And how is your relationship with your earthly father? What kind of honor do you give him? I don't want to exclude mothers. Actually, I know this is not an exclusive statement about the fathers. I want to use the general term, parents. When was the last time you really honored your father or your mother? And how did you honor them? Have you ever thought of one time when you were alone about your father or mother? In your solitude, when you, in your, when you are alone, have you thought of your father or mother? Do you know how excited your father was when he heard your very first cry in the obstetrician's arms? Do you remember his excitement when you were growing up? And when he drove you to school? And when he talked to you about his own childhood experiences? When you guys went on vacation? To the malls? To the pizza place? And to the, and to the burger joints? 
And have you ever thought of the sleepless nights? Your father was sitting by your bedside, maybe putting you on your shoulders when you had that little cough or a cold or a little fever. You are very important to him. You are extremely important to him. Do you know how much he panicked when you first decided to sit behind the wheels of that car? You know how much dreams you had, they had as you were growing up in school, in college. Then you, they send you away to school to the college and to the far off place. Ask yourself, how do I honor my father or mother? How did I honor my dad, father or mother? Brothers and sisters, how much do you talk to your father or mother about life choices in life? How much time do you spend with him discussing issues in life? About your career? About your school? About your priorities? Maybe he was not, he's not as educated as you are. He didn't go to the best of schools. He doesn't speak as eloquent as you do. But do you know, his love is very unique towards you. There's nobody else who can replicate that love. Do you know, he was expecting that you would go and talk to him, but you didn't. How do you honor your father? Jesus accused the Pharisees of his times. March 7, 10 onwards. For Moses said, honor your father and mother. And anyone who curses their father or mother is to be put to death. But you say that if anyone declares that what might have been used to help their father or mother is korban. I am not talking about calling them on their birthday or a father's day, happy father's day, happy mother's day, happy birthday, happy anniversary. Yes, I'm not talking about that. We have diminished our obligations to just by saying wishes. I'm going to bring it home a little bit. I know time is running out, but pastor said, take as much time as you want. Uh, but I'm going to do, uh, I know, I won't use it like that, but I'm not done. Did you honor your father and your parents in choosing your life partner? Or did you grieve his, his heart? in the choice of your spouse. Do you ever pause to think that you dishonored God when you said yes to that unbeliever spouse of yours? Do you know that you rejected your God when you accepted a spouse who worships the other God. Whose altar did you sacrifice your faith on the day of your wedding? And whose altar, my dear brothers, did you sacrifice your faith at the time of your wedding reception? Young brothers and sisters,
Don't be angry at me. I don't like to speak to you like this. But my heart is broken. I'm trying to share my pain. God gives you a once in a lifetime opportunity to honor God and your parents in the choice of your life partner. Honor your parents by honoring their God and upholding their faith in your marriage. Let this the generational blessings flow into you. Malachi 2.11 Judah has been unfaithful. A detestable thing has been committed in Israel and in Jerusalem. Judah has desecrated the sanctuary the Lord loves by marrying women who worship foreign gods. Satan wants to destroy everything about you. And he starts with your family by destroying the very foundation. He wants to destroy at the very foundational level by influencing you to make the very first choice about your marriage. Let me tell you, millions of Christian lives have shipwrecked just because of the wrong choices they made in choosing their life partner. The story of the Israelites is riddled with occasions when they chose, chose ungodly people in marriage and thus rejecting God. And the primary example is the life of King Solomon. His wife lured him away to the worship of false gods. Brothers and sisters, we are no stronger than Solomon. Don't be arrogant in your thoughts and in your attitude saying that you will influence your spouse back to faith. You know the commandment? The commandment is do not unequally be yoked with an unbeliever. Fathers and mothers, when was the last time you gave a hug or a kiss to your child? Your son or your daughter? When was the last time you went to them and said, I love you? When did you demonstrate to them that you truly love them? And care for them. Lavish love on them. Not because, what they, not because of what they do. But because of who they are. And more than anything else. Because of who you are. Deuteronomy 11. 21. 18 through 21. A rebellious son. Must be stoned to death. He must not be allowed to live. You know why? He's going to be a bad influence on the society. So they should, he should be stoned. In the parable of the prodigal son, the father saw his son coming from afar. You know what he did? He was relaxing outside in the porch. He jumped up and ran towards his son. You know why? Because the whole country knows that this is a rebellious son. And if anybody in the neighborhood saw him coming, he will be stoned before this father gets his hands on him. So he runs to him and embraces him. And if anybody decides to stone, the stone shall fall on the father. And that is divine. Honor your God by honoring your parents. I'm going to just quickly mention the next. I have so much to say, but 
I know. Honor your God in your by your worship. Verse 7 says, you're offering defiled sacrifices. He made it a question. They are asking, in what way you offer worthless sacrifices, blind sacrifice, sacrifices, and the lame and the sick by offering, number one, the dishonored God by offering Contemptible sacrifice. And Malachi is saying that you will not offer that to your governor. Let me ask you, my dear brothers and sisters. Do you think you will be sitting like this? I'm sure there will be a crowd here. I'm sure none of you will be having your texting device in your hands. You'll be very much honoring him. Let me remind you, it is not the governor that's here. The creator of the governor is here. The creator of the presidents is here. The creator of the kings is here. How reverentially should you be sitting here? How reverential should our worship be? How much prepared we must come for worship. You will not come and sing a, a song. You will not flip through the pages. Boom, 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 boom. Let me sing a song. You don't do that. The king is here and you're going to offer a sacrifice that is due unto him. You will spend time in prayer before you do anything here. You will spend time in preparation. You will want to listen to him before you do anything here. You want to, you want to know his heart before you start saying a single word from this pulpit. The ultimate purpose of every worship is to please God. Amen. Pastor, I don't have time and I'm going to stop here. Let me tell you, the purpose of every religion is to see God. Seeing God is the ultimate goal of every religion. But do you know what it takes you to see God? Blessed are the pure in heart for they shall see God. Did you bring a pure heart today to worship? Yes, you are doing a lot of things. But you are serving a God who is looking at your heart. Cain and Abel, both of them went to worship. They both, I believe, they both brought pretty decent offerings. I don't believe in the fact that Cain brought some, some crooked and all those kind of things. I don't think so. I think he brought the best of what he could do also. And that was not the reason why he was rejected. The reason he was rejected was God looked at his heart. It says that God blessed Abel and his God rejected Cain and Do you want to be accepted? Do you want to be accepted? Bring a clean heart before God. A heart that is reconciled with God. A heart that is sprinkled by the blood of the Lamb. A heart that is 
purified by the, by the word of God. A heart that is reconciled with God and says, Hallelujah. Bring to Jesus a life that has been spent on knees with, for, in prayer. I'm going to stop here. Ma in, 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 in Revelations, chapter 3, there's a portion. I'm going to read it and just conclude. Revelations, chapter 3. If Malachi was the last message to that generation for 400 years, I want to share with you a last message from the last book of the Bible that came to an earthly church. And there was no more message after this to an earthly church. And that is written in chapter 3, verses 15 onwards. To the angel of the church of the Laodicea, I know your work. And you are neither cold nor hot. I could wish you were cold or hot. So then, because you are lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I vomit you out of my mouth. Because you say I am rich, have become wealthy and have need of nothing, and do not know what you that you are wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked, I counsel you to buy from me gold refined in, this, in, in the fire. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. This is a church that is so miserable, so wretched, but they are so wretched, but they think they are doing very well. They are so pitiful, but they think they are so healthy. They're so poor, but they think they are so wealthy. They're so blind that they don't even know that they are blind. They're so naked and they don't even know they claim to be clothed. What a miserable situation. And they think God is in their midst. But God is outside knocking. Can a church be more pathetic than this? If the prophecy of Malachi has any semblance to the church in Laodicea, it is not coincidental. Because there's no message after that to a church. This word is perfect. This is the word of God. Repent, return, reform, and turn to God because unless we start honoring our God when the trumpet call comes, we'll all be here. We'll all be still here. God is coming for a people pure and sanctified who is looking for him. And you and I are waiting for him. And it's going to happen. That will be the next biggest event in history. I pray that our days ahead will be sanctified by the blood of the Lamb, by the word of God, and by the Spirit of God, let us humbly submit ourselves into the hands of God that we may start honoring Him in our life, in our personal life, in our family life, in any kind of situation that we are in. Let us start honoring God. May the Lord bless us.